family, some we love and some we wish we could trade in. Hello everyone, I'm Alvin King and welcome to We Speak. And you're watching DC TV, the nation's community television network. DC TV, the nation's community television network. According to a New York Times article, dozens of studies in the past decade have found that teenagers who regularly eat dinner with their families are healthier, happier, do better in school, and engage in fewer risky behaviors than teenagers who don't regularly eat family dinners. These findings have helped give dinner time an almost magical aura and have led, led to no small amount of stress and guilt amongst busy moms and dads. But does eating together really make for a better adjusted kid? Or is it just that families that can pull it off or pull off regular dinners also have other things, perhaps more money, more time that themselves improve child, a child's well-being. So I'm going to ask the panel today, um, do you think that the uh, America has gotten away from family dinners uh, that the New York Times uh, have said is pretty much overblown? Um, I think they have. I think that families today are very busy. Both parents have jobs. They have to work to make ends meet, and a lot of families don't have the time. It's not that they don't want to have dinners. They just don't have the time to sit down with their kids and have those dinners. And I think that it's good that they, if the parents that do have those dinners are able to do that because kids today are out of control. When I was younger, my parents always instilled in me to act right, be right, have great manners and stuff like that. And that happened in the family home. And a lot of kids don't have that family home unit right now because parents have to work. We're in very rough times, and it's not the parents' fault. We, they have to put a roof over their child's head first. That's the first priority. And um, most parents, they just don't have the time. I think it's a time issue. Yeah, a lot of homes are broken, too, so there aren't many homes. Or I guess back in the days, you'd have most American families that you had both parents in the home, and you had the 2.5 kids and the dogs running around. But now you have a lot of single parents, whether it's a single mom or a single mm -hmm. dad, that's trying to raise a family. And so, like um, Chris said, a lot of them aren't home. They're working, but we've just got to take ownership and take responsibility and try to do what we can. So if you've got one parent, maybe that one parent can sit down with their kids and practice better behaviors as far as dining at the table alone. I think even when I'm at home, how often is it that I think about that I sit down at my, my actual table mm -hmm. and, and dine? Because more often than not, I want to sit in the living room on the couch. I want to watch TV. There is so much going on. It's tough. But having said that, I, I personally feel that it's important that uh, family dinners, uh, that a family have family dinners. I know growing up myself, that was important to me because when we had family dinners, we, when we would sit and talk, um, it helped with uh, uh, being respectful to, to people. It helped you to talk about your day. It helped you to better your communication skills. So I know what you said is, tr or is true. Families are busy right now. Parents can't take the time to do it. But does that mean that it should not happen? Oh, I think parents also can communicate with their children in other ways. Again, like I said, it's all about a time issue because, you know, with scheduling and stuff like that, kids have their schooling, they have after activities, parents have to work, they have their things. I don't think you absolutely have to sit down at the table to have a loving conversation. You can have a loving conversation in the car on the way to somewhere. You can have a loving conversation while sitting in the living room. I don't think there's a particular place that you have to have that conversation. As long as the conversations take place. Okay. Whether it's five minutes or mm -hmm. five hours, I think the conversation should take place, but it doesn't have to be per se at the table. Okay. But you, I, Go ahead, James. I'm sorry. I, I think meals are so important, you know, and to share a meal with your family, it, it, it's kind of symbolic. It's bonding, you know, and, and it is a, a really good place to get everybody together, but there's so many distractions, you know, the soccer and, you know, the computer and, and uh, um talking on, on their phone and, and texting, you know, and I, I think it would be a good thing to get back to having meals together and sitting at the table and, you know, it, it's just something that, I, 
I didn't do it with, with my family, okay. you know, and I'm sure my family yeah. before they probably had that, or maybe not, you know, I don't know, but I, I think um, we've definitely gotten away from it. I think it would be something to get back to. To the basics, just mm -hmm. getting back to the yeah. basics. Uh, let me ask you, is, is, it a, is, is it a parent's responsibility to help their child with his or her self-esteem issues into adulthood? I absolutely think so. I think that your parents are always a positive force in your life, and I think that parents help you mold you into the person that you become in in the future. For me, my mom is still there. My dad passed away, but my mom is still there. She encourages me every day, okay. and I think that it's something that I, I don't think it's a parent's responsibility, but I think it's something great to have in your life if a parent does that for you. Because my mom does it for me. I don't I don't want my mom to feel responsible that she has to lift me up every day, but she does it just by a phone call. So she does it even without her knowing she does it. Okay. You know what I mean? So yes. I don't, I can't say that it's a parent's responsibility to, to lift you up every day, but it'd be great if you had that in your life, I think. It, it could be done. I mean, parenting is a lifetime, it's, it's a lifetime choice. Mm -hmm. It's a lifetime decision and it's a lifetime job. So not just when your children are younger, as they become adults and as they grow mm -hmm. older, you're still responsible for being there okay. from the beginning to the end. So mm -hmm. if it's a daily encouragement, definitely as a parent, you've signed up for it. That's what you should do. But you know, a lot of people don't understand that concept. Mm -hmm. Today, um, anybody can have a child, but it takes a special person to be a mother. Mm -hmm. And I think that a lot of people don't realize that. And a father. And a father. <laughs> <It's> a <lot laughs> Even more so, probably. <laughs> right. A lot of people don't realize that, and they don't realize, you know, the whole, you know, I don't think a lot of people have children, and they don't realize exactly what they're getting into. Mm -hmm. And they don't, re and that's what happens where families start to go south. Because some people, I feel, that just aren't meant to have children. Right. You know what I mean? See, it takes a lot to have motherly technique and motherly, you know, and fatherly technique, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. To be able to be there for your child emotionally. Because children need a lot of emotional support. Right. You know, and a lot of people can't give that because they don't have that themselves. Right. So, okay. I think it's right. interesting when you see how people interact with their children, mm -hmm. you know, when you're out in public. And, I mean, it, some of it is really disturbing to see how <laughs> adults talk to the children, you know, e either way, you know, I've seen people talk, don't do that, da, 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 you know, and it's like when they really need <laughs> to be stern and then other people who are stern to cursing their children out, you know, and just so angry, you can see how angry and, and unhappy the parent is and they pass it on to their innocent child, yeah. you know, it's really uh, kind of disturbing, you know, mm -hmm. and, and I, I do think that um, it is the parent's responsibility to, to help with the child's self-esteem, you know, mm -hmm. and, and to support their child, you know. Okay. I'm going to ask if at birth you could have uh, chosen your family. Would you choose one over the other? Um, I, I think I did choose who were going to be my parents. Mm -hmm. And um, I think I chose, they were who they were supposed to be. You know, I, I lost my mother when I was 13. And I do believe, you know, mm -hmm. she has been there for me on the other side. And I don't think, I, I, and I honestly think if she had gone, if, I, if, if she had not gone when she did, I don't think I'd be here today. Okay. Chris Riley? Well, I, I got to first think if, if my mom's going to see this or not. <laughs> <laughs> I think she, but no, um, I, I, I didn't get a chance to choose. Um, you're so lucky. Mm -hmm. But um, the, the parents that God gave me were amazing. So mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't have done anything differently. The foundation was there. I mean, we all grow and we all learn. Everybody makes mistakes. So my right. parents made mistakes, but they grew from them. I grew from them. And I don't think I would be where I am or the person that I am with, without the experiences that they passed on. Oddly enough, I, even though I have the relationship that I, or the lack of relationship I have with my parents, um, I don't think I would have done it any different I, if I could have chosen mm -hmm. because it made me who I am, you know, um, going through what I went through with my family um, or with my parents growing up. Uh, it just made me stronger. It, it taught me so much about the world and it prepared me for how the world could possibly treat me. So I don't think that I would have, ever, I know I wouldn't have done it any different because I wouldn't be who I am. Mm. Yeah, That's good. I don't think that I would have changed anything. It's like I said, again, um, as you said, parents, they make mistakes. We make mistakes. You learn from them and stuff. But I, but I think I had two um, very wonderful parents who supported me continuously throughout my life. You know, as I said, my dad has passed away. My mom is still there. And, and now I take care of her. Um, I think that, you know, we're put on this. We, we don't have to let who brings us up determine our fate in life. You do what you, you make your own decisions, I feel. And I feel that... Um, if, even if you have a bad set of parents, you don't have to 
to turn that around. That does not have to happen with your family. I think life is all about decisions, and I mean, I feel that I'm blessed with what I have, and I hope you guys are blessed with what you have. Well, um, I'm blessed with what I have, but uh, I grew up in an abusive uh, rela uh, family uh, relationship, and uh, my dad was very abusive to my mom. But I have to agree with Riley, seeing some of that uh, as a child didn't feel good, it, um, but it made me the man that, that I am. I know there mm -hmm. are things in my life that I wouldn't, that I do based on what I learned as a kid, uh, what, being in that type of relationship. So um, if I could trade in anything, would probably have a dad who wasn't so abusive. So, so you know, if I had to do that. Yeah, I mean, I understand what you're saying. Like, for me, my dad, I had, I had more of a relationship with my dad when I was in my 20s than I did when I was younger, because my dad, even though I, when I told my dad I was homosexual at 18 years old, but my dad was, you know, I'm biracial, so my dad was a redneck man. <laughs> and I know that sounds crazy. However, but, but when you grow up in the country and your father is a redneck man, he has no concept of what it's about. Right to be homosexual. It just it wasn't, it didn't, okay. wrong phrase. It didn't, it didn't match, it didn't match up. So, I mean, even though it, I wish I could have got him to understand earlier so we could have had more of a relationship then, but I'm happy and blessed with what we had. Should your parents have been more strict or less strict with you? And how strict were your parents when you were growing up? And how do you think it affected you when you became an adult? My, I, I was raised by my mother. Uh, my parents divorced when I was two. And I was very mature as a child and a latchkey child. So my mother would allow me to make decisions on my own. I learned how to cook when I was young. You know, so um, it, it, I would say, and, and I was allowed a freedom. Um, I interacted with a lot of adults. And uh, I would definitely stand up for myself. Right. Um, with adults and I would let them know how I feel and it's like if this is not okay I'm gonna let you know at 10 years old I will let you know you know and I was supported to do that and, and I'm so appreciative of it because it's definitely made made me the man who I am today mm -hmm. you know it's like I don't take you know bullshit from That's people why you're so it's bossy. like yeah. <laughs> that, that explains so that right it, it's tough and it's interesting because it depends on the child so I grew up in a household with my mom, and I had a younger brother and an older sister. Mm -hmm. So she was really strict on them, but not as strict on me. Right. Um, and it really depends on how mature your child is and how much you think that they can handle. Mm -hmm. Some kids do require a little bit more attention. Some of them you can kind of just let them go on, give them the, the foundation and the basics that they need, and they'll be fine. So for me, I don't need you to be strict. I actually like to manage myself. You just sit in the corner and come when I call you or when, when I do something wrong and I need to be disciplined. Mm -hmm. But other than that, I don't like ma micromanaging, whether it's at work, whether it's at home, just leave me be. But some kids really require their parents to be there 24 seven standing over them and helping to make decisions. But then when you see them as adults, they still require that same attention and then they really can't function on their own. So it's a double-edged sword. Well, for me, I was, uh, I was raised by a nanny until I was 13 years old. Mm -hmm. And then after that, I pretty much kind of raised myself. My parents were never really around. And um, it's kind of funny because some of the things that people are taught when they're younger are a lot of the things that I didn't know as an adult. Mm -hmm. Like I had to learn on my own after I got on my own in my 20s. Um, and so it probably would have been nicer to have my parents there, you know, coaching me along. Mm -hmm. um, another thing is like they didn't, they don't really know who I am or they didn't really know who I was as a teenager because uh, they were never really around. So uh, things like decisions with money and how to do certain things that most people are taught, you know, we never talked about that um, as a kid. And so it kind of, as an adult, when I, when I'm, when I, well, I ran away from home, I, I think I've said that before on the show, um, but when I ran away from home and I um, had to learn to do everything on my own, mm -hmm. it was just sort of like forcing me to grow up really, really, really fast. Mm -hmm. um, so it would have been, it would have been great, but I think it would have been different mm -hmm. um, because I, I did have to learn all that stuff on my, my own and I'm proud of that, but um, it would have been a lot easier. Okay. I think I'm kind of, um, I'm glad that my parents were kind of difficult on me because, I mean, they weren't difficult, but I knew that 
when certain things I knew that I had to act, I had I was always taught to say yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. My parents taught me, you know, to go to school, get an education, and make something better of yourself. And my parents also taught me to be someone who is selfless. Mm -hmm. I help everyone. If anyone knows me, I I go out of my way to help everyone, and that's something that my dad did, and something that my mom does. And I just think that for them, I'm glad that they taught me just to just to be happy and to do what I want to do. And, but they did have a little bit of a strictness toward me because I knew certain things. Like when I was a kid, when I looked up and I saw that street light going dim, I knew it was time for me to be in the house. <laughs> when my mom said me, called me by all three names, I knew that there was a problem. You know what I mean? And I think that that's one thing that's wrong with the parents today, that they don't, you know, there's a difference between beating your child and disciplining your child. There's a big difference. When I was young, yeah. My dad used to be a belt on my behind. My grandmother used to make me go outside and pick switches. And if it wasn't strong enough, she made me go get another, <laughs> made me go get another one. Yeah. But I think that kids need that. Right. But today, if a parent is to whoop their children, that kids can call and call, you know, child protective services. And I and I'm sorry, but if if a parent was called but with you know on child protective services, when I was a kid, mm -hmm. everybody I knew would have been in jail. <laughs> because, afraid to call. Yeah, yeah. because afraid to call. because I think that parents need to give that discipline back. Because look at the kids today, though. If you take kids from 20 years ago to today, kids are killing each other. They're right. ki you know killing each other over tennis shoes, over over just over anything. You know what I mean? They're trying to kill their teachers. They're trying to do all this. I never thought about anything like that when I was younger. Nothing. And you, you think know? and you think a, a lot of uh, how kids think today is because a parent is, is not as strict as, exactly. as he or she could be. Exactly, and I hate to be blunt, but the parents need to learn to tear their asses up. <laughs> okay. Because there is there is a difference between letting your child just run rampant. Okay. I mean, and I just, I just feel that if you go out, if we walked outside right now, you see kids running down the street that are like five and six years old. My parents would never let me get out of their sight at five and six years old running up and down the street. It would never happen. So let, let, let me ask you, if one of your parents asked you if, uh, you thought they they did a good job in raising you. Would you give them an honest answer? Absolutely. Absolutely. Wow. You can't wait to be asked. Yes, ma'am. Please that, ask that, me that, that, that question. Okay. Okay. <laughs> No. <laughs> uh, well, since that happened so quickly, um, I'm, I'm gonna. Uh, this question that I'm gonna ask you before we go into a commercial break um, is pretty. I guess uh, I, I'm gonna say when when we were talking about this particular show. This is one of the more important questions here, um, and I, I'm really curious to see how you guys are going to answer this. Uh, have you ever been envious of the relationships you've been, um, that you've seen between your friends and their parents? No, I haven't. No? No. You say no? No. I absolutely um, have. I think when I was younger, my family and I had a different relationship. Mm -hmm. And as I got older, I met people who had more expanded relationships with their family um, and they incorporated their friends in that as well and then I decided that I wanted that for my life so I started emulating those same behaviors with my family and it took a while to get them to come around to it because it's not something that they were used to and it was something as small as hugging them every time I saw them and when it first started I could feel them just like really crunching up because they weren't accustomed to it right. and I said I have to be willing to be rejected in the beginning but I'm going to continue to, to do it and as years went on now when I see them they hug me as soon as I see them and I see them passing it on to each other okay. but I was able to implement those behaviors that I did envy into my own family and it just feels like a completely different set of people now and I'm happy about it. Wow. Envious, no, but I always thought it was strange. Um, I would have friends, and one of my best friends, um, she and her mother are like, they are best friends. Mm -hmm. And I always thought it was the most foreign concept. Like, your mother's your friend? Like, I didn't get it. And she also didn't get the fact that the relationship that I had with my mother. So every time I would tell her any story about it, she just didn't get it. She's like, well, that's your mom, and you, you just got to you know, do this, and you got to do that. And I find that people that have a really great relationship with their their um, their parents don't really understand what I went through mm -hmm. as I don't understand them being so close to their parents because mm -hmm. to me my normal was not that right. <laughs> you know so not envious I just always kind of thought it was kind of strange but I do um, think uh, as you were saying before like you make the decision mm -hmm. to you know pass things down and um, or not and my decision is if I ever have kids, um, hopefully one day I will, uh, but if I ever have kids, I want to basically kind of do it 
a little a lot different than how you, um, were, and than I, how you were raised ex absolutely okay. because I, I think I could make the decision to pass all of that down or I get to say stop it stops right here in this generation you know I'm not gonna pass it to my kid I'm not gonna um, you know I'm gonna be a lot closer I'm gonna be there for my kid I'm gonna be in my child's life um, and be supportive of them whatever they choose so um, yeah envious is not the word I would use I, I would I, I think I always thought it was a little bit strange, but mm -hmm. only not strange to the world, but just kind of like strange to me because that was not my dynamic with my parents. Well, I know there was a period of my life when I was definitely envious of uh, some of the kids that, that I grew up with because they had what you call the total package. You know, they had the mother, the father, um, they had the picket fence, they even had a dog. Leave it to be. <laughs> um, you know, um, they, they came out of their house knowing that a parent was going to come, both parents was coming to see them at school and that play or to even even to their graduation. Um, I didn't have that, um, but through through all of that, um, I think that's probably when I, and I know this is probably another show, but when I became closer to God, because I, I realized that, you know, through prayer, um, a lot of what I went through helped me overcome some of the um, the feelings that I had from being env envious of them. And I do love my mom. She raised me very well, um, but there were times that I thought, Ooh, could this have been another way? Mm -hmm. And I think it's also it comes with age when yeah. you're younger. Mm -hmm. Everybody want everybody sees something else and they want it. They they want their life to be like that. You mm -hmm. know, you when you turn the TV on when you when we were kids, you, we we always saw the the, the ultimate families like mm -hmm. like the Huxtables. Why can't we be like the Huxtables? You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? Why can't we be like mm -hmm. this and that? Mm -hmm. and I think it just comes with age. And I think when you get older, you learn to appreciate exactly what you have, mm -hmm. and you don't try to change the person. You accept them for who they are. Yeah, they are. There's That's no true. there's no reason to try to change that person. You just have to love them for what it is they do because love comes in many different forms and some people show it in many different ways so love comes and change they need to change exactly. <laughs> especially if you appreciate who you are exactly. today you right. know because it did create uh, all of your experiences has, has, has created who you are you know and if you accept who you are and you're happy with who you are mm -hmm. you know and that you know I didn't certainly didn't have the perfect upbringing you know I was raised by my grandmother I had very few male figures around me you know but it was what I was given right. and you know I had a lot of love you know that was given to me and uh, I, I appreciate that you know I always, I'm, sorry. I'm sorry like you said earlier Riley it's the pathology and we do have I mean love is change and we do have to make some changes if we know that it wasn't right for how we grew up we definitely have to make the changes so that when we raise our children yeah. and our children's children it's not the same thing that we experienced. We were able to fight through and make it and, and be successful with what we have. But if we have the choice to change the, the pathology, we don't want to pass that on. Right. Exactly. I, I always say I forgive my parents for everything and blame them for nothing. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I, I see so many people blaming their parents for what's going on in their life. At mm -hmm. some point, you have to take responsibility mm -hmm. for yourself. Mm -hmm. I'm 32 years old. I cannot blame something that I do wrong or that goes wrong in my life on my childhood, mm -hmm. you know, because I have learned from it and I've grown from it. So mm -hmm. I have to make the choice to mm -hmm. take responsibility for things in my life that happen in my life. On that note, everyone, we're going to take a commercial break. Ladies and gentlemen, stay tuned. We'll be right back. Thank you. Look, I had a rough day at work. I don't need you hassling me about my smoking. Hey, I just smoke when I'm out with my friends. Yeah, cigarettes are expensive, but I work, I pay my bills, I can afford it. You know, you gotta die something. Might as well be cancer. What are you passing along to your kids? Quit for yourself, for your family, for your legacy. For free help, call or go online. <coughs> just a little cough. Nothing to worry about. When you throw away money on wasted electricity, you're throwing away everything you could have bought with it. Saving energy saves you money. Learn more at energysavers.gov. Hello, everyone, and welcome back. Um, this has been a pretty, uh, <laughs> a pretty good show thus far. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're going to keep it moving. Uh, this question, uh, I think I, we were talking about it before we went, uh, or while we went the uh, commercial break. So I think the panelists are ready to answer this question. If you could go back in time and whisper into your mother's ear while she was pregnant with you, what would you say? I, I think I'd whisper something like, go to hair school now. 
like go to hair school now. <laughs> because it, it's it's funny because I think <laughs> when I was growing up, my mom had no clue as to what to do with my hair. I think my texture came out different than hers and different than everyone else in the family. So the funniest thing is like maybe five years ago, she said, I have a confession. Well, what's your confession? She said, I actually felt like I was a white person who adopted a black child. I had no idea what to do with your hair because my hair was thicker, it was fuller, it was more coarse mm -hmm. than anybody else in the family. So she had no clue. And then I would have probably whispered, I don't like those little basketballs. Like she gave me, yeah, it was just terrible. I, I would whisper for her to go to hair school. <laughs> Nine months at least, she okay. could have gone to hair school. Okay, James? I would say um, follow your instincts. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna be really special mm -hmm. and I'm gonna need freedom. I'm gonna, you're gonna need to allow me to express myself. And don't be afraid, you know, it's gonna be all good. Okay. I would obviously say just to remember to love me for me and always have understanding, because I'm one of those people, I'm kind of complex, but in the end, everything does work out. Okay. You guys are so prolific. Oh, uh, yeah, right. <laughs> right. Why do I have well, to answer? Ask her. <laughs> <laughs> I'm about to go to hair school. <laughs> prolific embryos, I can't take it. Um, <laughs> she ought to made her man already. <laughs> I'm gonna turn my head while you answer this question. <laughs> well, you know, if I cry. whisper in my mother's ear, mm -hmm. uh, I just tell her, relax. Um, she, prepare that what you're pushing out is not what's gonna it's gonna end up being. Oh, <laughs> you know. Okay, okay. Um, you know. Here's my thing. I, I, you're, I think sometimes, and I'm not a parent, but I think parents need to realize that your kids are not of you. They mm -hmm. come through you, mm -hmm. and. Um, you know, from the time that you're pregnant with a child, mm -hmm. you have this idea of what your kid's going to be like, um, what their life is going to be like. And you have all these goals for mm -hmm. them and all these okay. expectations uh, for them. And the thing is, you're setting yourself up for failure because your kid is never going to be what you want them to be. They're going to be themselves. Mm -hmm. And right. I am absolutely nothing like my parents wanted me to be or thought that I would be. And so I probably would just say, let your child just be your child, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and probably would have given her heads up that I was going to become a girl. But, um, <laughs> okay. you know, I, I, I really, and, and honestly, uh, I don't really have an, an, an exact thing for what I would have whispered to my mother. I, I, I can't really say. Just love me for just me. Just love me for me. Love me for me. Love exactly. me for me. Yeah. Well, I know uh, during the commercial break, and we were talking about this question, I, I told the uh, panel that, I was born with a broken leg, so I probably would have told my mother, talk to the doctor and have them to take me out easy. <laughs> I have a feeling, I don't know what happened during that process, but somehow when I came out, I had a broken leg. Did you and come I, out feet first? And I, I think, I, I don't know how I came out, but I came out with a broken leg and had to wear a cast for nine months. And wow. I, wore, I wore 10 pounds, so imagine a cast and a kid who weighed 10 pounds, my poor mom. So I would have told the doctor, just take it easy and get, get me out of here. Okay. Big baby. Yeah, okay. Uh, <laughs> what or if is there a, a cutoff age for blaming your parents for your emotional psyche? Well, it's just like what I said earlier, you know? <laughs> At some point in your life, you have to take responsibility for who you are. You can sit and wallow in that blame um, for as long as you want, but it's, it's not gonna make anything better. Um, playing the blame game. But is there an age or is there a, a moment or is there a time in your um, in your life when when your parents um, when, when that should happen? Maturity. I can't really. Yeah, I don't think it's I don't think you can say there's a definite age, but at, at some point in your life, you need to let that go. Mm -hmm. I, I have family members who have held on to things that their parents have done and and it shows in their their character. It shows in their skin. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's like really deep down stuff that mm -hmm. they've just suppressed. And it's like, you need to let it out. You need to feel it, let it out and move on. Okay. Well, I mean, and considering how fast kids are growing up today, at 12 years old, you can almost have that same type of conversation with, 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 with someone. Is that a, a, a good age to have that conversation with a 12 year old who thinks that he or she's grown? I don't know. I think the question itself is kind of, because we all have different circumstances, mm -hmm. so it's hard to say for me, because I know that there has been stuff that, horrific things that parents have done to their children, and someone will carry that with them for the rest of their life. 
You know what I mean? You know, for example, this is, what happened to you during your lifetime? You're going to carry that for the rest of your life. So it's hard to say if there's an age limit. You know what I mean? Because you might, you might not. I, it's so hard to explain because you like you, you, you don't want to hold your family accountable. But in the back of your head, what's going on in your life or what happened to you will be there until the day you die. Mm -hmm. So some of the stuff that, you know, parents should be held accountable for some of the things that they do to their children because it, it plays on the mind and on the heart. You know what I mean? And that, that happens with, with any kind of relationship, I think. But I don't think there is I just feel like you have to use it and grow from it mm -hmm. and not... You know, use it for good, yeah. and not use it to just wallow in depression and mm -hmm. woe is me, and mm -hmm. and make an excuse for yourself right, for right. every single thing that you do. But you know, know? Some people just can't. Yeah. You know, it's a, it, it all it like it all. I guess it all depends on the situation. You know. Well, um, this question is actually uh, that I'm going to pose is to you, Riley, and, okay. and Chris. Um, I know bo both of you have been friends for for, for a very 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 long, a long time, time, a very long, long time. time. And Chris, I know that you grew up in a, a family where your mom was extremely supportive, or your family was extremely mm -hmm. supportive of you. And Riley grew up in a family where, in a, in a family where she didn't have that support or that same type of uh, relationship that that you have. Given that uh, you two are really, really close friends, how how do you how are you there for each other in, in that particular situation? Well, I, you know, I've known what Riley's gone through her entire life, and. The thing that I've always told her, and I think you know, when we've had our conversations, is that she's a wonderful person, and she can't let what happened to her in her past determine her future. Mm -hmm. But I always tell her that it's no matter how hard she tries, it's always going to be right here because it's like a scar on your arm where you've been cut. You, that's that it might heal, but you're always going to see that scar, and something's going to trigger that memory, mm -hmm. and it's always going to be right here. I always tell her to try to grow from it but it's always gonna be in your heart. So, you know, people don't understand that the stuff that happened to us in our life, we have options to like forget about it, but when it hurts so bad, you can't forget about it. It's like a scar on your heart, so. Mm -hmm. And I hope, and I think that, you know, she's an amazing person because she's living her life. She's doing what she wants to do. Mm -hmm. She's being the person she wants to be, and she's not allowing someone to dictate her future. Mm -hmm. Now, she, her, she has a great family, but if her, her family does not want to accept her, they don't have to be a part of her life. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. They have to realize that she is her own person. Mm -hmm. And what they need to realize is they created the person that is standing in front of them. Mm -hmm. They should love her mm -hmm. for her. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? They never try to change the person that they created. It goes back to what you said earlier about you know the family realizing, you know, just realizing that this is me and this is who I want to be and this is who I am. It's not like you decided one day, oh, well, <laughs> I don't have anything to do today. <laughs> yeah. I'm just going to give mom and dad the shop room. I think of anything else to do. <laughs> right. have, right. go out to the mall with my friends. I yeah. just want to tell mom I want to be a woman and then they all go to yeah. bed. And you, you, know? you know, the great thing about it, having someone who is like Chris in my life is I've been able to create the family. Like people always say, we can't choose your family. Uh, bullshit. Family. <laughs> mm -hmm. right. Right. I right. have created my family. Right. Um, I moved here and didn't know anyone here. And um, the people that were my friends, I, I drew close to. Uh, the people I made friends with, I drew close to, and they became like family to me. Mm -hmm. And so you are, you know, exactly. part of my family. Mm -hmm. And so when people say like, "Are you going home for for Thanksgiving, or are you going to see your family?" I'm like, "Yeah, <laughs> I'm home, and I'm going to see my family." It's not. It, I my family is absolutely what I cre have created it to be. Mm -hmm. um, not saying that I've disowned my parents or my sisters or anybody. Um, it's just I found in my friends mm -hmm. the, what I did not have your, in my family growing up. Family. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And mm -hmm. I think also, too, for the future, one good thing that I think you need to do is you need to start making more. I know it's going to kill you when I say this. I think you need to make more of a conscious effort to be part of their life. Go visit. and try, Because the thing is, regardless of what happens, that's still your mother, that's still your father. And see, and that's, that's what I'm talking family. about. People who, didn't have, who have great relationships yeah. with their mother and didn't have my mother, Always oh, say I, that no, to no, me. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm saying it for the fact so of... Always say I, that I, to I'm me. I'm saying it for the fact of, regardless, <laughs> without Christmas them, couch. you would not be here. Right. You know oh, what I'm saying? Oh, absolutely. So, regardless, I still think you should be a member and, like, be just an active member of their unit. You don't have to agree with anything they do. You don't have to agree with anything that they say. But, you know, when they're gone, you're going to miss them, regardless of how well, they treated you. Not necessarily. Yeah, and I, mean, I say that because they're not a part of my life now. And I, I, don't I think if, if you I can, can, I guess if you can make, if you can make <laughs> decisions without regret, 
you know, if mm -hmm. she should happen to lose yeah. her, her, her parents and, you know, and know that she's done everything that she had to do, you know, to, to forgive them, you know, to reach out to them and whether you accept it or not, you know, and to move on. I mean, I, I've had that relationship with family members where, I mean, I actually had to write letters to them not to send it to them, but for me to get out everything yeah. I needed to get yeah. out yeah. so and I can forgive you yeah. mm -hmm. and I can move on. Yeah, and that's what I always say, like, I didn't forgive, I forgave my parents, but I didn't forgive them for them, and I didn't even have to say to them, I mm -hmm. forgive you. I forgave them for me. Right. Yep. And that's my thing is forgiveness is not amnesia, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. I, for I forgive it and I, and I move on with my life, but it's not amnesia. I still remember it and yeah. I still, you know, but it, instead of using it as a crutch, I grow from it and I create relationships mm -hmm. with people that are meaningful and that are, you know, what I wish I would have had with but, my but I, I never told you to forget. Oh, no, no, I know. <laughs> I said that that's still your, your sisters and everything. You just, Absolutely. I, I feel that it just, this is my, I Absolutely. always, I'm gonna tell you, I always stand up by myself because I just, this is just how I feel. <laughs> I feel that regardless, I don't care what happened in the past. I, 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 I trust me, I have not had the, I had a better relationship with my parents in my 20s than I did when I was younger. Mm -hmm. You know, being being gay, they didn't understand it. They said some very hurtful things to me, but mm -hmm. I, I just, you know, I got over it. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I didn't get over it. I still think about it, but it's past. Right. You know what I mean? And my thing is, it's just those, regardless of what happens, your sisters are there. Mm -hmm. They can't, I mean, even though your parents control basically how they mm -hmm. reacted to you mm -hmm. and stuff like that, that's still your family and you only get one. You only get one set of family. Well, she, she, she made a second set. I, <laughs> she I made, made a second, second set. set. She, she does have Biological. a second set. Biological. Family. Family. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> you, I didn't expect that to go <laughs> in, in, in that direction. So, um, <laughs> but, but, but it did. Um, do adult children owe anything to uh, their parents if they didn't have the best relationship uh, growing up? Mm. Did we ask this question already? Do they owe them something? Yeah, no. We we asked the question like, but answer <laughs> that question, Chris, please. Um, I don't think, um, I think, like I said again, life is all about choices. Mm -hmm. You make your own choices. Mm -hmm. I don't think anybody owes anybody anything. Um, when I walk out of here right now, I have the choice to go to McDonald's. That's my choice. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I have the choice to do whatever. I think that we as adults make, we create our own path. Right. So I don't think we owe anybody anything. So would you uh, cut a family member uh, out of uh, out of your life simply because your relationship is too volatile? Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. So is, is there is there a limit? Is there something that you know that would really take you to that place to cut them out? Um, for me, I, I've cut out some family members, and it's not because of oh I was just upset that day. Um, um, when, when my dad was passing, mm -hmm. my, I, live, I live here, which is 300 miles away from where my mom lives. All of my family were five minutes away from his nursing home. I was there twice a week, and they wouldn't even go to see him when he was in the nursing home. So, like, I completely shut those people out of my life because I don't need... I, in, li in life, you don't need to have all that negativity. And, you know, when people just constantly try to just take and take and take and take, and, I, and you don't need that in your life. Mm -hmm. um, Again, it's it it kind of like a double standard for what I was saying about her family. But <laughs> you know that's where I was going, right? I knew that she was actually where I was going. I can feel you the blood. You can see me coming off like that. Yes. Okay, well, go ahead. But, <laughs> but again, I did not tell her to go and, you know, and have a, a June Cleaver, leave it to be relationship with her family. I just said, make sure you have some sort of relationship. I didn't say go with, you know, hugging, sending Christmas cards or anything like that. I just said, make sure that you're still in... Pardon me. Still, <laughs> still in that whole realm of just having them in your life is what I was saying. But no, I cut them out for a reason because I don't need that negativity. I'm sure that now that I see what you're saying now, kind of all. <laughs> so, just, but yeah, see, so, here's but, the thing. But, but, okay, but w w when do you feel that it's appropriate to cut them out? I think it's very individual. Pressure, right? Very individual, <laughs> you know. I mean, it could be for something small, but you know, or maybe relatively small to them, but really important to me. Right. Okay. You know, it's like if you don't get me. You know, and actually, you don't have to, and I don't have to be in relationship with you. I've right. got family members. I, I never have to see them again in, again in life, right. and I'm good. You know, don't wish them any harm. I hope they have beautiful lives, but I don't have to see you again. I don't have to be in relationship with you. But you know? think about it. We cut people out of our lives all the time if they're, you know, if they're, we feel like they're not meaning any good to us if they're not related to us. Right. Why is our family any different? Mm -hmm. Just because we're blood related. If you're meaning me any harm or no good, 
Yeah. Just because we're blood related shouldn't mean that you get an exception for me cutting you out of your life. And, and, I, and life. I hold my family to a higher yeah. standard. Absolutely. I mean, Absolutely, you, we're, as a person, you, you have your list you know. of do's and don'ts. You have yeah. your list of non-negotiables. And it doesn't matter who steps over yeah. that line. For me, it's loyalty. Mm -hmm. It's trust. If I ever feel like I can't trust you or I feel like you're not loyal to me, mm -hmm. it's, done. it's done. There's nothing mm -hmm. you can say or do. I've given you that speech up front <laughs> in the beginning of mm -hmm. friendship. And it's the same with especially family they yeah. know you they know what makes you tick they know mm -hmm. your hot mm -hmm. spots and they're the first ones usually that that touch them mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> well I, I have a low tolerance for people embarrassing me because I can do that on my own I can embarrass <laughs> myself I can go out here and act a fool and be a fool but when a family member chooses to do something that embarrasses me and know that they're embarrassing me, for example. Um, I mean, I, I, I do occasionally have a glass of wine, if you will. But when I realize that it's putting me in a place where, you know, it's mind altering, you stop. But you have those family members that take it to that next level and it becomes kind of messy. That is the cutoff for me. That's when I, when, when, uh, when I say to myself, okay, I'm going to leave you alone for a minute, let you get yourself together, let you realize what you've done, and then we'll pick this back up tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's usually when, when they go to that, that level. So you and, 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 and like you said, family I hold to a higher level than, than friends or people who are not my family members. I'm sorry, were you going to say something? No, I was saying I, I agree with you. I think I don't even let it get to that point at times. I like, I have the fiercest ability to tune people out. So, so you when the you fiercest went, ability? Right, when you, get, like when you get to that point where you have to see me cut my eyes, and I've, I've tuned you out already. Uh, I'll focus on something else. How much of who you are now would you say is a result of uh, the family uh, of which you were raised? I'd say it's what? I, I would say mine is peace, like different pieces. I took different pieces of what my family said, mm -hmm. and I applied it to myself, and then I took pieces of what I wanted to do. I think you, I, for me, I think it's maybe, it's maybe it's, like I said again, I can't give you a percentage, mm -hmm. but I think it's pieces. Like again, it all goes back to that whole thing about choices. You make the, cho the choices you make when you get into an adult. You can choose to take those pieces of what your family did, you know, maybe your manners or how you interact with people. Um, I think it's just all about pieces of what you choose to do. Yeah, I think it's those experiences that, you know, help create who you are, mm -hmm. you know, good and bad. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, um, and, and maybe not so individual, you know, well, maybe so, you know. It's like I had a grandmother who's very loving and then a grandmother who was not so loving, loving right. you know, and she is who she is, mm -hmm. you know, and that's, you know, it, and it really, it, it, I guess it boils, it is what it is, right. you know, and it's all about what you choose to do with it. You know, I've gotten past it. You know, it's like she just was not that lovey-dovey kind of person. It wasn't me that, you know, she wasn't, she was lovey-dovey to no one, you know. <laughs> so it's like, you know, <laughs> and, and then you kind of, you know, you, oh, you end up paying the price for mm -hmm. not giving that love when you're in a position where you need people to help right, you. And, right. you know, um, so I, I think at the end of the day, it's important to make choices, loving choices and, and having, you know, family around you to be there for you, be their friends or blood relative. Blood relative. Well, you gonna say I think um, very little, um, mm -hmm. very little, um, because I, 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 I consciously made a decision to, and they will even tell you this, my family will tell you I'm very much not like any of them. They're mm -hmm. like, I'm the black sheep of the family. But um, I did make a conscious decision to do things a lot different than were done in my family. Mm -hmm. um, and like I said, when I moved here, I was very young. Um, and the people that became my friends helped mold and shape me really into who I am right now, more so than even my family did because, um, because it was such a negative experience for me right. growing up. I think I tried to push as much of it from myself um, as I could. Mm -hmm. And so I think I'm a lot mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm definitely uh, very little, and if if I am it, anything as a result of that, it's it's a conscious decision also to do things a little bit different. I, what keeps coming back to my mind on a previous show, you had even uh, exposed or 
you told us that you were raised uh, Jehovah Witness. I, well, yeah. So, <laughs> so I mean, <laughs> you, <laughs> yeah, it's a kind of it's kind of a, a weird situation because I grew up um, what some people would call privileged, yeah. but um, I also grew up as a Jehovah's Witness too. So there were boundaries, but then there were no boundaries. Right. Uh, so it, it, it's very. It's a very odd thing. Okay. Like one day we'll have to sit down. And I'll tell you all about okay, it. Tell me but all about it is it. just it's a lot. <laughs> well, this goes into our next question. How has your upbringing affected your views and desires on parenthood for yourself in the future? If any of you are considering becoming a parent. Uh, absolutely. I think that again, mm -hmm. it, it goes back to um, when your child gets to that point, it goes back to decisions on how you want to raise your child. Mm -hmm. I think I've said the word decisions like 75 times during the show. I mean, it all depends <laughs> on how, um, how you want to raise your kid. I think for me, I want my kid to have discipline. I don't want to be that parent who's breathing down my child's neck. I want my child to be creative, be free, mm -hmm. you know, be able to live a great life and to make his own decisions. And if that decision is a bad one, we're going to pick up from that and we're going to learn from the new decision that we made to press on. Mm -hmm. I think that as long as my kid has manners and my kid is able to be functional in society and not turn out to be some of the things that I see today, mm -hmm. I think that I will know that I've done a good job as a parent and I will make sure that I try to let my kid be, just be free mm -hmm. and not be afraid to be who he or she is. Mm -hmm. I think you know this. I've wanted to be a parent for probably like the last seven years. I'm obsessed with babies and kids and all that stuff. And most people, if you know me, you, you know that. But if you don't, you probably think, really. Um, but for one of the reasons is um, because I want to do it differently. Mm -hmm. And I want to be there for, I think, the influence that I had is so that I could do the opposite. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I want to be there for my kid. I want to be supportive. I want to, you know, I want my kid to come home from school and I'm there mm -hmm. um, and you know not go days and days and days without seeing my kid mm -hmm. um, for that reason um, so it taught me how not to be a parent I think okay. um, but also like I said before to not pass that that pain down from one generation to the right. other but mm -hmm. to do it a little bit better Shane were you gonna say something I think um, my parents actually played a huge part in what I will be as a parent and, and how I'll shape that out. I mean, they gave me the most important thing anyone could ever give anyone um, after life would mm -hmm. just be the gift of knowing who God is. Mm -hmm. And they introduced that to me and they gave that to me and, and that was the best thing they could have ever done. Mm -hmm. And that was a great foundation. So I know that's definitely something that I'll take with me and pass on to my kids. Mm -hmm. um, and in addition to that, they gave me character, they gave me strength, they taught me how to be an individual. And I got a lot out of it, but like Riley said, you take what you want to take as good, and then the bad stuff you kind of throw away, and you know this is what I won't do. Mm -hmm. And I think that'll definitely make for a better parent in me. Okay, James. Well, I actually have no desire to be a parent. Mm -hmm. um, I think you have enough dogs. I, I, I have <laughs> enough dogs. <laughs> yes, I think I would have been an excellent parent. Um, I'm at pop pop age now. So I have pop no pop desire. Age. Huh. Pop Define. Age. Hashtag <laughs> pop pop age. Okay. <laughs> I love that. Okay. It's like 50 plus. It's okay. like I'm pop All pop right. age. Right. And it's like, you know, I, so my energy is, is kind of depleted for, for child energy, you okay. know. Right. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm really patient. Um, I would have been an excellent parent, but I really have no desire to be one. Okay. Well. I have, I'm not a parent, and I have lots of nieces and nephews, and I'm very happy, all right, with the way things are. Send them are. home. Okay. <laughs> some, relatives, some relatives you have to love from a distance. How do you feel is the best way of getting around personal issues with that person for the sake of civility? Facebook. <laughs> Facebook. Facebook it is. I, I think for those relatives of mine, I'll just post things on Facebook specifically so that they'll see that I'm alive and they know that I have stuff going on. But I don't have to talk to them directly. I don't have to answer any questions to them directly. And I can post on their page, happy birthday, hey. That's good. So social media, social media has, has stepped in and taken care of that for you. Mm -hmm. Okay, James? I agree. I agree. I totally agree. Well, now my, I know the my, truth. mine is mm -hmm. kind of 50-50 because I have, a, my dad's side of the family is very country bumpkin. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so <laughs> Facebook would not be the option. <laughs> 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 so when I go home to see my mom, I just, you know, I, you know I'm civil. 
but that's that's the cutoff. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no sense of being nasty or rude. Mm -hmm. I've realized that I have to let a lot of things go. You know, that yeah. I have, so, so I, I, I'm still, well, I'll have a conversation, mm -hmm. but that's as far as it goes. Yeah. Um, and it, it, it's sad that, you know, you said do Facebook, it's sad that you have to do that, but I know, like, for you and I are kind of alike, that's the mm -hmm. only way that we're going to remain civil mm -hmm. is just to say hi and from a distance. Mm -hmm. And I say that, I, do, I have a lot of family like that. It, I call them from a distance, mm -hmm. from a distance, love, you know, hi, <laughs> that's it, mm -hmm. you know. So um, I think that social media helps and then just a phone call or whatever, but very seldom do I sit down, like, we're sitting down and have a conversation with, you know, that side of the family. But my mom's side, I see them on occasion, so I talk to them more than I talk to my dad's side. You know, I have cousins that follow me on Facebook and Instagram. Um, for me, it's quite, because <laughs> they were so torturous to me as a kid. Um, for me, it's like the biggest F you. Like, look at me, this is what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And so I will post things and they comment on it. I don't respond back, but like they will, they, I'm like, <laughs> I know, it's not terrible. But I, for me, it's just sort of like, for all of you who said that I would never be or that I could never do, this is who I am, this is what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. um, I don't really have a response to <laughs> to them, like, mm -hmm. you know, like like. But that that's is great. They're, they're, exactly, Silent. that is You're exactly. So I always think success is the best revenge, anyway. So, all right. Sure. Well, thank you. We're going to take a commercial break, ladies and gentlemen. We'll be right back. My parents say I have to be home right after work. <sighs> that's so gay. Totally gay. That is so Emma and Julia. Imagine if who you are were used as an insult. When you say that's so gay, do you realize what you say? Knock it off. Traditional light bulbs actually generate nine times more heat than light. Switch to Energy Star light bulbs and you'll realize just how much cash you are really burning through. Saving energy saves you money. Learn more at energysavers.gov. Welcome back, everyone. Recently, a woman who suffered emotional and physical abuse at the hand of her mother wrote a scathing obituary after her mother's death. It read in part, on behalf of her children, who she abrasively exposed to her evil and violent life, we celebrate her passing from this earth and hope she lives in the afterlife reliving each gesture of violence, cruelty, and shame that she delivered on her children. Do you feel that a victim of bad parenting owes the parent homage after their death? Uh, I have a little side note. The mother of four died alone in a trailer park surrounded by her 13 cats. That's tough. <laughs> Flabbergasted. <laughs> Wow. Uh, you know, I, I think for the, the, the person who wrote the obituary, um, they sound really bitter and they okay. sound like they're in a really dark place. Okay. And, and they need to forgive their mother. Mm -hmm. okay. You know, it's, it, it's definitely karma, you know. Um, they, they will never be happy until they forgive what their parent did to them and to be able to move on. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think um, the person does sound bitter. However, being uh, a person who uh, who spoke at my dad's uh, funeral uh, and really wasn't in a good place, it I didn't speak as as badly as she did. But it gave me an opportunity to let something something go. Uh, and again, I didn't take it where she took it. But I think it is an opportunity for someone to to release. I don't know how really bad her situation was with her mother, or, but it sounded like it really wasn't a good place. So I'm, I, I'm not advocating write a letter like that or, 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 or do that at a funeral, but I could see where she, the way she did it helped her. Were you eventually able to forgive? Oh, I forgave my dad l before I spoke, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. I still needed to speak. To get it out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I guess my only concern with that is, is it's almost unfair because that person doesn't get a chance to, to rebuke what you've said mm -hmm. and that's a one-on-one -on -one conversation. That's a conversation or a letter that you could send mm -hmm. to that person mm -hmm. prior to their death. Mm -hmm. But to actually do it once they're gone and now you've announced it to everyone without giving them, it's really cowardly. I was going to say, is that cowardly? It's, it's yeah, it's very cowardly. cowardly. Yeah. And the worst part is, is she clearly needs help. Yeah. 
But the work, you can't take that back. Once right. you've said that in front of everyone that's there, right. you can't take it back. So how do you even look towards redemption at that point? Right. It definitely sounds like someone who was trying to get revenge mm -hmm. um, in someone's death. And like you said, it's kind of unfair because that person's not there to give a rebuttal. Um, but I think when you get the chance to get that kind of revenge, and like I said in the previous show, mm -hmm. and you take it, mm -hmm. it means that you're not over it. Right. It means that mm -hmm. you are still bitter. Mm -hmm. um, even what I went through with my family, I would never do that. I would never um, go and, and say like hurtful harm. I tell the truth um, when you guys ask me questions, but on someone's obituary, like it's like, really, that's so tacky. Yeah. Revenge on and the And it dead. doesn't speak to, <laughs> it's does now that? not speaking to what she was like as a mother. It's speaking to how you are as a person now. Right. She's not Absolutely. Sure. Right. Yeah, I think also, too, that, you know, if the person was trying to get revenge, <clears throat> the woman already had, they already, I mean, in life, I think you, you get back what you dish out. The woman died by herself with her cats. She shut out everybody around her. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I think it's to the point where, you know, it's not going to do you any good to let your mother leave this world and people think mm -hmm. that of her. Mm -hmm. It's almost, it's, it's, you know, a level of disrespect for me because I don't care how bad someone was to me, I would never leave that on an obituary because, mm -hmm. you know, that's something that you and your mother should have took care of together, not something that people will see for the rest, you know, of their lives thinking about her. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's, I, I don't know if that made the person feel good mm -hmm. or what. Mm -hmm. That sounds like somebody that got cut out of a wheel. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I don't think I'd copy and paste that in her, but you're right. That's not nice. Huh? Right. <laughs> terrible. This is what she said about me. Terrible. <laughs> Whoa, well, I, I have to laugh. I'm sorry, Riley. It's your statement about the person. It sounds like a person got cut out of a wheel. Yeah. <laughs> in another situation, yes, that, that may be true, but n not according to this letter that we have. Okay. So, um, well, that looks like it uh, wraps up our show for today on Family. I want to take an opportunity to thank James, Shana, Riley, and Chris for being here today. I also would like to thank our studio audience for being here today. We really appreciate you uh, being here. And until we see each other again, I'd like to bid you farewell when next we speak. Thank you.